Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. For the last few videos, we've looked at how various thermodynamic properties are related to one another. These include heat, work, energy, entropy, and enthalpy. Today, we'll look more deeply at the practical consequences of how these are related to each other. To understand these practical consequences, it helps to look back at why physicists became interested in thermodynamics in the first place. Thermodynamics didn't start as just an abstract area of physics. It really became an area of interest because of the Industrial Revolution. Thomas Newcomen invented the steam engine in 1712, and the design of the engine got a big improvement thanks to James Watt in 1776. That made steam engines a very practical source of power, and by the start of the 19th century, steam engines were being used to power factories and train engines. So, steam engines were a hugely important new technology in the early 1800s, and lots of scientists and engineers were interested in understanding the details of why they worked and how they could be made better. One of the people who became intrigued was the French engineer Nicolas Sadi Carnot. Carnot was a lieutenant in the French Army's engineering corps. During his service, he happened to watch a cannon being manufactured. When a cannon was made, it started with molten metal being poured into a mold that gave the cannon its shape. But that gave a cannon that was a solid piece of metal with no hole going down the barrel yet. To turn the cannon into a hollow tube, it had to be drilled out. But there was no such thing as a power tool yet. How did they drill out a solid piece of metal like this? The trick was to use the power of a team of horses. Several horses would be harnessed to the arms of a turnstile. As the horses walked in a circle, the turnstile would rotate. The center of the turnstile was above a hole that had been dug in the ground, and the cannon was buried in that hole with the muzzle facing up, so that it was pointing at the center of the turnstile above it. A sharp drill bit was attached to the center of the turnstile on the bottom, with the point facing down and touching the center of the cannon's barrel. There was a heavy weight on top of the turnstile so that the drill bit was pressed down onto the cannon. So, when the horses walked and turned the spokes of the turnstile, it rotated the drill bit. Slowly but surely, the drill bit would scrape out tiny shavings of metal from the center of the cannon, so that eventually a hole was drilled into the barrel. As you can imagine, this is a very slow process, and it took several days for the hole to be drilled in this way, but at the end, the hole would be drilled all the way from one end of the cannon to the other. But when Sadi Carnot saw this process, he noticed an interesting phenomenon. The drill bit turned fairly slowly, but even so, the drill and the cannon barrel became intensely hot. In fact, they became so hot that there was a danger that the metal of the drill bit and the cannon would melt slightly, and if that happened, they might be confused together. That would ruin the whole cannon, so it was important to keep the metal cool. This was done by occasionally pouring water onto the metal. Carnot noticed that the metal was often so hot that the water would immediately boil and clouds of steam would come from the drill. So, that meant that the drilling was producing an immense amount of heat. And that was because of the friction between the drill and the cannon. But where exactly was the heat coming from? The horses, the turnstile, the air, the ground, all were much cooler, and so were the cannon and the drill bit at first. Carnot realized that some of the energy that the horses were generating was being converted into heat. This is one of the consequences of the first law of thermodynamics. The energy of a process can be converted from heat to work, or vice versa. Carnot reasoned that any process would be more efficient if more of the energy that went into it was expressed as work instead of heat. For example, the process of drilling a hole in the cannon would be faster and require less energy overall if less of the energy that went into the process was converted into heat. This idea led Carnot to think more deeply about steam engines. Carnot realized that the way a steam engine operates can be broken down into four steps, a process we now call the Carnot cycle in his honor. 
Today, we recognize that the Carnot cycle that describes how steam engines work can be applied to any engine that generates heat. In a real engine, there's a chamber containing gas, and as the volume of the gas changes, it moves a piston that ultimately turns a wheel attached to the engine. Carnot imagined an ideal engine in which the piston could move up and down in the chamber without producing any friction. That wouldn't be true for a real engine, but it's a simplification that really allows an engine to be understood. If you've taken a physics course before, you've probably encountered the idea of ignoring friction in order to make our models simpler. Also, in a steam engine, the chamber containing the piston is attached to two other chambers, called reservoirs. The first reservoir is at a high temperature. That's where the steam is generated. The steam is released into the chamber with the piston, and once it's cooled down, it enters the other reservoir, which is at a lower temperature. In a practical engine, this cool water would then be recirculated back to the boiler to be heated again. So, using this simple model, Carnot imagined a four-step cycle that explains the important principles of the thermodynamics of the engine. In the first step, steam is injected into the chamber, which raises the piston. The steam in the hot reservoir is under pressure, so as the vapor enters the chamber, the pressure decreases. What about the temperature? Well, the steam in the chamber is still in contact with the steam in the hot reservoir, so the temperature remains at that hot temperature, which we'll call Th. Because the temperature stays at Th, that makes this an isothermal process. If we plot this step on a pressure volume graph, we get this. The system starts at P1 and V1 and ends up moving along the isothermal path until it reaches P2 and V2. Notice that the volume increases, as we knew it would since the piston is being raised, and the pressure decreases. In the second step, we imagine that the opening between the chamber and the hot reservoir closes. Ideally, the sealed chamber is now perfectly insulated, so heat can't get in or out. In reality, that's not possible, but again, Carnot was imagining an idealized engine, because that makes the thermodynamics of the process easier to imagine. Anyway, since the connection between the chamber and the hot reservoir has been closed, the temperature now decreases, until it eventually is as cool as the cold reservoir. Meanwhile, the momentum that the piston acquired during step one keeps it moving up, so the volume continues to increase and the pressure continues to go down. If we plot that on our graph, we find out that at the end of step two, the system is now at a new, even lower pressure, called P3, and a new, higher volume, called V3. Also, the temperature is now lower. You might recall from way back in video 9 that the curve that shows the change in the pressure and volume of a gas at a given temperature is called an isotherm. In that video, we saw that for an ideal gas, the isotherm gets closer to the axes as the temperature decreases. So the isotherm at our new temperature, Tc, is closer to the axes than the one for Th. Also, remember that we said the chamber in which step two takes place is well insulated, so that means heat can't get in or out. That makes this second step an adiabatic process. Next, we'll look at step three, which is essentially the opposite of step one. The chamber is now at the same temperature as the cold reservoir, and we open a connection between the chamber and the cold reservoir. The piston has by now reached the top of its range of motion, and the momentum of the rotating shaft it's connected to forces the piston down, so the volume decreases and the pressure increases. Meanwhile, because the chamber and the cold reservoir are connected, the temperature stays at Tc, the cold reservoir's temperature. On our graph, here's how that looks. It's another isothermal th step, but this time it's a compression instead of an expansion. At the end of the step, we're at yet another new pressure and volume, P4 and V4. 
Finally is the fourth step. In that step, the connection between the cold reservoir and the chamber is closed again. The chamber is, once again, imagined to be perfectly insulated so that heat can't get in or out. However, the motion of the piston is still compressing the gas, so the volume decreases and the pressure and temperature both increase. At the end of the step, we're back where we started at the beginning of step one. So on our graph, our last step brings us back to P1, V1, and the hot temperature, TH. This was another adiabatic step because the chamber was insulated to prevent heat from getting in or out. So that's the Carnot cycle. But apart from being an interesting model of an engine, what can we learn from this? Actually, it turns out we can learn plenty from it, and realizing that is what made Carnot so insightful. For example, let's think about the energy of these four processes. In the last video, we reviewed the energies of isothermal and adiabatic processes, and now's where that information will become really helpful. We saw that delta U for an isothermal process is zero, so that's the energy for steps one and three. Meanwhile, we saw that the energy of an adiabatic process is CV times delta T. For step two, that's CV times TC minus TH. And in step four, it's CV times TH minus TC. So those two steps have energies that are equal but opposite in size. So when we add all four of the energies together, we see that delta U for the whole cycle is equal to zero. That makes sense. As we saw in video 21, the energy of a cyclic process is zero because energy is a state function. Now, what about the heat? Let's look at the heat change for each step in the cycle. Steps two and four are both adiabatic, so we know that the heat for those steps is zero. Meanwhile, for an isothermal process, the reversible heat exchange is RT times the natural log of V2 over V1. That makes the heat for step one, R times TH, times the logarithm of V2 over V1. And the heat for step three is R times TC, times the log of V4 over V3. When we try to add the heat for all four steps, it looks like we're not going to be able to add steps one and three to get a simple expression. But actually, we can use something else we learned about in the last video. You might recall that for an adiabatic process, we have this expression that connects the volume and temperature. So, for example, for the adiabatic process of step two, the final temperature is TC and the initial temperature is TH. Meanwhile, the initial volume is V2 and the final volume is V3. Let's compare that to the adiabatic process in step four. In that process, the final temperature is TH and the initial temperature is TC. Meanwhile, the initial volume is V4, and the final volume is V1. If we compare these relationships for the two different adiabatic processes, we can see that there are some similarities to notice. If we flip the expression for step two, we find that the left side of both expressions is the same. So we can set the right sides equal to each other. Now, if we raise each side of the equation to the power of three halves, the exponents will drop out. So we find out that V3 over V2 is equal to V4 over V1. Finally, we can multiply both sides of the equation by V1 over V3. If we do, we find out that we get a result of V1 over V2 equals V4 over V3. Now, why did we do all that? Well, let's go back to the values of the heat that we found for each step in the Carnot cycle. Take a look at step three. 
the expression there has v4 over v3 in it, and we just saw that that is equal to v1 over v2. If we substitute that in and then flip the fraction, we have to change the sign on the right side of the equation, but it means that the logarithm term is now the same as the one in step one. Now we can add the heat for all four of the steps, and when we do, we find out that the overall heat is a fairly simple expression. The heat exchange during the Carnot cycle is R times the difference in heat between the two reservoirs multiplied by the logarithm of V2 over V1. That result is actually a really big deal. What's so special about it? Well, think about the three things that we're multiplying together in this equation. R is the gas law constant, which of course is a positive number. The middle term is TH minus TC. By definition, TH is the higher temperature, so the term in parentheses here must be another positive number. Finally, V2 must always be larger than V1 because the gas was expanding in step one. That means that the logarithm is guaranteed to be another positive number. So we're multiplying three positive numbers together, which means that the heat exchange will always be positive. In other words, it's impossible to convert all of the energy we put into an engine like this into work. We will always lose some of the energy as heat. As we'll see in the next video, that has deep implications for the efficiency of a mechanical device, like a steam engine, and it also tells us about the entropy and the way it affects the world in ways that we can see in the lab every day. Before we finish up, let's also look at the work produced in each step of the Carnot cycle. We know that the energy is equal to the sum of the heat exchange and the work, thanks to the first law of thermodynamics. Therefore, the work is negative R times TH times the logarithm of V2 over V1 for step one, CV times TC minus TH for step two, R times Tc times the logarithm of v2 over v1 for step three, and Cv times Th minus Tc for step four. That gives us a total of negative r times Th minus Tc times the logarithm of v2 over v1 for the work of the overall cycle. There are two things to notice about that result. First, it's equal to the value we got for the heat, but opposite in sign. That's what we should have expected since the overall energy for the cycle is zero, and the heat and work must add up to give us that energy. The other thing to notice is that since we already saw that the heat must be a positive number, so the work must be a negative number. As you might recall from the definition of work, when the work is a negative number, that means that work is being done by the system. That's certainly true for a heat engine. The whole purpose of the engine is to perform work. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll see how Carnot used the insights we just learned about to describe the efficiency of an engine, and we'll see that it has deep implications for the entropy, and tells us about how the second law of thermodynamics affects chemical reactions and other natural processes. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.